guys. Uh, welcome to, I think this is session number four in the Database Ology Lectures. Uh, we are super excited today to have the, uh, the Facebook guys that work and work in RocksDB. If you don't know this, RocksDB is a fork of LevelDB, a better version, if you will. Uh, and Facebook has been doing a lot of work to obviously optimize it and make it do things that LevelDB cannot do. And they're actually using it in production today. Um, for some of the things, and maybe they'll still talk about it. Uh, the great thing about Igor Kanadi and Mark Callahan is that they come from the fabled uh, University of Wisconsin Madison School of Databases. Right? So they both have master degrees uh, from Madison, and where they work in databases and learn all the skills that they need um, to work on RocksDB while they were there. So eventually, it will not be Madison will not be the champ in, in producing awesome database graduates. CMU will be, but that's that's another story. Um, I think that's all I got. And so I'm um, just to say also too that Mark is the chief database recruiter at Facebook, and he also recruited Domas, which is the top Lithuanian working on MySQL. Uh, there, among other things, is that correct? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, guys. So. <clears throat> I've been dealing with uh, open source. Which mic am I speaking into? The, the, the mic on you is for the video. Okay. The mic there projects to the audience. You probably use that too. Okay. So I've been uh, working on databases for about 20 years. The first half was at uh, Informix and Oracle. Uh, so closed source databases, which meant I, I never uh, got anywhere near a production deployment of a database, uh, which wasn't the greatest way to learn about uh, what is required. Second half of my career has been MySQL and, and now RocksDB, a lot of open source databases, uh, definitely web scale, so Google uh, and now Facebook, very large sharded uh, deployments of databases. The purpose of the title is to show some of the motivation that has changed over time with uh, RocksDB. Initially, uh, we were definitely chasing performance, and now we are chasing performance with uh, quality of service as we try to uh, expand the use cases. Uh, personally, I, I advise uh, a couple of projects, RocksDB, uh, Mongo plus RocksDB, MySQL plus RocksDB, um, and then Igor is one of the leads from the, the RocksDB effort, uh, definitely writing much more code than I write. So the, the overview, uh, I will just, we have a, a short summary of, of how RocksDB came to be and, and where it is now. Uh, Igor will cover the uh, architecture of RocksDB, and then I will cover work in progress, problems we're trying to solve today, and then uh, open problems that definitely I hope that the team solves, but I think there is some interesting research to be done in, that, in this area. For the story of RocksDB, uh, at the time in, in 2011 or so, I was still focused full-time uh, dealing with InnoDB for MySQL. Um, someone else uh, decided to try out LevelDB and, and got some interesting performance results where they were, uh, the key result was you know, how many page reads per second can we do from fast storage. We had a few servers in production with uh, dual PCIe flash devices that could do, between the two devices, could do about 100,000 or 200,000 reads per second for, a, let's say, a 4K or an 8K read. Uh, and, and so that kind of being able to saturate that, that I.O. capacity was interesting. Now, um, what happened was I ran some tests on, the, on level DB in a similar setup, and my results were lousy. And so I said, ah, Level DB, it's not so good. There's too much mutex contention here. Um, it's slow. And, and so the, the reason for talking about this is I had a performance result from Level DB that was lousy. Uh, I made a conclusion based on that, but I didn't take the time to figure out why the performance was lousy. And it turned out in this case, I was using MMAP. Uh, the database was larger than memory. We were running uh, Linux 2638 which had some mutex contention issues on the, the virtual memory management. So if you're 
M mapping a database larger than RAM, you're constantly um, getting into the VM system to change page mappings. Um, and the, the trivial fix was just to not use M map, just to use uh, P read. Um, so it's just a, a common thing I see a lot when people are publishing performance results that if you are publishing results you don't understand, um, you're likely to make a few mistakes. We had internally some uses of Tokyo Cabinet, and generally those users were unhappy to, d to discover that uh, it wasn't crash safe. Uh, the lack of crash safety is documented, but it's kind of buried in the documentation. So we had embedded users of databases that just were not happy with the systems that they were using. Um, <coughs> eventually, level DB, once we got past the MMAP performance problem, um, found some few, uh, some workloads. The, the big problem with level DB is it's not meant for server workloads. By design, it's meant to be simple. Uh, what, and it's a compromise that they're making, which is a good choice for a, a good target workload. But compaction is single-threaded. So if, if you need to do, sustain a lot of I.O. throughput for compaction, level DB will fall over. Um, and it, it's funny that a couple of projects that have forked level DB have learned this the hard way. Uh, Bitcask uh, or React Basho um, tried a level DB fork, and then Cornell has a level DB fork, and they all seem to rediscover that oh, yeah, single threaded compaction is not a good thing. Um, we've done a lot of optimization to get better I/O throughput, to get better monitoring, to get uh, better control over the write amplification we see from compaction. And just a lot of features. Uh, recently, we added uh, transactions. So we have optimistic and pessimistic concur concurrency control. For pessimistic, we do repeatable read. It, it's uh, similar to Postgres style semantics. Uh, we're using that for MySQL, but we also hope that uh, some pure RocksDB clients get it. Uh, and just a lot of other features continue to get added to, to RocksDB. So now is uh, Igor's time to speak. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so I joined the team about 2013, and this is when the project was still called LevelDB, but we already like made uh, many improvements, like multi threaded compaction, we had backups, merge operators, a lot of new features, uh, optimizations for in-memory workload, and also for uh, flash-based workload, um, and we switched the name to RocksDB, and in November 2013, we decided to open source it. Um, and by open sourcing it, we opened it up to external users, uh, and by that, by that point, we also had uh, many users within Facebook. I think today we have like something about 10 billion QPS um, across all the different services. And for external users, uh, very early on, LinkedIn and Yahoo picked it up LinkedIn is using RocksDB as a, a storage engine for their uh, follow feed uh, and also for uh, Apache Samza, which is LinkedIn project. Uh, Yahoo is using RocksDB as a storage engine for their Sherpa, which is their distributed key value store. Uh, and CockroachDB is a very exciting new database coming out uh, from some guys at New York, uh, ex-Googlers, uh, which we are very excited about. And then more recently, Microsoft added a port uh, that ported RocksDB to um, to Windows, Airbnb uh, is doing something uh, we don't know much about, but you know we see Airbnb engineers posting on our mailing list. And then Pinterest is just now building some system uh, that uses RocksDB. So we saw a lot of explosion both within um, Facebook and uh, in external users. And of course, we are very happy about, about this. Um, so now, what's next, right? Like we we see a lot of success. Uh, what are our n new challenges? And what we're currently focusing on is uh, bringing RocksDB to general purpose databases. So up to now, we've been using it as an embedded storage for different applications, um, both you know, uh, at Facebook and externally. But we also want to make it such that you can use MySQL and MongoDB. Those are our first two databases that we are targeting uh, with storage engine replaced with, with, uh, with RocksDB. And the uh, status of MongoRox, this is how we call our plugin, a RocksDB plugin for MongoDB. Uh, it's been running in production at Parse. Uh, Parse is part of Facebook that uh, 
does like mobile uh, backend as a service kind of thing. So you write your mobile application and it stores the data uh, for you um, for some amount of money. Um, yeah, and we've been working on it for like last uh, year, but we've been running in production for for past six months. Uh, we saw huge storage savings uh, compared to old um, MongoDB that was pre Wire Tiger. Um, we saw compression from five terabytes to uh, 285 gigabytes. That was very surprising, but it turns out that Mongo does over provision some um, some storage space, and also they they didn't used to have uh, compression, so it's like big win. This is snappy, but even without compression, uh, it's, I think, yeah, about 10x without compression. Uh, power of 2. Power of 2? The power of 2 padding. Yeah, because Mongo has some padding. So, uh, But yeah, with snappy, it goes even further down. Uh, this is comparable with WireTiger, a bit less than WireTiger, but WireTiger also obviously has uh, big savings versus non-compressed uh, Mongo. And we also support document level locking versus uh, DB level locking or compress uh, or uh, um, the collection level locking in 3.0, uh, which means our P9 latencies go way down and, and there's way fewer problems uh, on high concurrency workloads. So Parsis has been happy with this. Uh, this is all open source, so we also have some external users, but not much. Uh, we've been also happy to learn that Percona is offering enterprise support for Mongo rocks and for rocks in general. Um, so yeah. This, this is a you know ongoing project, but so far it's been pretty successful. And then uh, we have another project that, that is trying to bring MySQL and rocks deep into MySQL that we call MyRocks. And uh, as you might know, most of Facebook's data, like the prime user user data store, is uh, MySQL. So that's where all of your likes and comments live. Uh, and we've been just trying to experiment with how would you know MySQL do if it switched from InnoDB to uh, which is what we currently use for, as a storage engine. Uh, to RocksDB. And uh, two interesting findings we had was, uh, this was very surprising to me, where when you port, you know, we took our one of our production instances and we moved it to, like just replicated it to MySQL on, on RocksDB, we found that the database uh, size on disk that, that we see is 2x less. Uh, so, you know, let's say, you know, DB was two terabytes, uh, RocksDB took only one terabyte for the same data. Uh, and the same was true for uh, bytes written. So let's say, you know, uh, InnoDB was sending 100 megabytes per second to flash storage. With RocksDB, we are sending, uh, let's say, only 15 megabytes per second. So what this means is we can use less uh, flash devices, but, it, you know, with, byte, with uh, bytes written reduced, we can also make those flash devices last longer. Um, and it also means we can add one more billion users with the same hardware we have today. Uh, without having to buy new hardware, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so this was like initial experimentation, and once we saw those results, we decided to invest much more uh, resources and effort into the uh, into this project. Uh, currently, it's like very very early alpha stage, but we hope to have something very stable, let's say by end of next year. <clears throat> so now, now that we told the story of RocksDB, how it came to be, let's dive a bit into the architecture part. RocksDB is based, uh, same thing as LevelDB, uh, on log structure merge trees, or as we call it, LSM trees. Um, LSM trees, data is organized in many files. Uh, and in leveled LSM tree, uh, files are organized uh, by levels. So you have level 0, level 1, level 2, and so on. Uh, there are two kind of things to note about this uh, structure. The bottom level is the oldest data, uh, and this is and also the, the largest level. So in this case, I have this example configuration here, level four, we can set to be like, let's say 500 gigabytes. Then your 500 gigabytes, basically your database uh, is in level four. And then basically upper levels, level three, two, one, and zero, those are just deltas flowing in uh, from, you know, from newer updates flowing in uh, down to level four. So data's flowing top down. Uh, on the top, uh, top level, you can see this is a mem table. Mem table is just in-memory write buffer. Um, so all the writes go into mem table, and then they got flushed down to level zero, and then eventually, via a process called compaction, they end up uh, in level four. Uh, each level is configured usually to be 10 times bigger than the previous one. Uh, so in this case, if you set level four to be 500 gigabytes, level three will be 50 gigabytes, uh, level two with five gigabytes, and, and so on. Um, so let's say, you know, let's kind of like trace down what hap 
happens when we have a key value that get, gets written into rocksdb. Uh, so you have a key and a value. First thing we do is we write it to write a head log. That way, even if your process crashes, uh, we can still recover data uh, and get to the same state. If, if your machine crashes, then you lose some data if you don't f-sync, uh, but you can still recover most of it from write ahead log. Uh, then once the key value is written to write ahead log, we apply it to memtable. Memtable is a skip list uh, we use as default, although we have some other implementations, uh, but in most use cases, it's a skip list. So we add the key value um, to the memtable, and then we're done. Um, so our writes are pretty fast. You just append something to write ahead log, uh, if you don't have sync, it's, that, that's just like memory copy. Uh, and we also insert this key uh, value to the, to the mem table. And we, basically, we're done. So in the foreground, almost nothing happens. Uh, and then in the background, once the mem table gets full, uh, in this case, let's say bigger than 64 megabytes, we flush it to level 0. And level 0, we organize uh, files by time. So we have oldest file and newest file uh, that gets flushed from, from uh, mem table. So flush is one process. Another process that pushes files down um, is called compaction. And what compaction does, it takes one file from, let's say, in this case, level 2, and then takes all the files from level 3 that overlap uh, with files from uh, level 2, and just merges them together. Uh, gets the, you know, does the merge sort and outputs new files. And those new files then go on to live in level 3. So once the uh, level is full, we do compaction and push the one file that we choose uh, down to next level. And so at some point, all the new data ends, uh, ends up in level 4. So to reiterate, in the foreground, so in the user thread, write just goes to write head log and then goes to mem table. And in, in the background, when the mem table is full, we flush it to level 0. Uh, and when level is full, we do the compaction. So the level stays, uh, stays nice. So how does then how does read work, right? Let's say I want to get the value of some key. Um, if there ha there has been a recent write, you will see there's a key in mem table. So if you find the key in a mem table, you know what's the latest value. You can just return it immediately. However, if you don't find the key in the mem table, then you have to go uh, read the files. And uh, there's one thing I didn't mention before. Uh, level zero is special. Level 0 is special in a way that files in level 0 are, can cover the whole key space. Uh, so each file here can s contain um, keys from, let's say, A to Z, if you consider English alphabet. However, levels 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so on, they are partitioned. So each file here only contains subset of um, key space. So in this case, for level 1, we could have one file from A to B, another file from C to D, and so on. So basically, when you read a key, you need to go through all of the level 0 files, uh, basically on, in time order. So you first go to the newest level 0 file, then you check if the key is there. If it's not there, you go to the second level 0 file, and so on. But once you, let's say you don't find the key um, in any of level 0 files, then you have to go to, to level 1, but you only have to go to one file in level 1. You only have to go to one file in level 2, level 3, and level 4, and so on. Uh, so this looks like a lot of reads from disk. Uh, but actually what's happening uh, is we have bloom filters. And bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure that takes a set of, let's say, keys, and uh, it produces a data structure that, that's pretty low on memory. Uh, and it can tell you, no, this key is certainly not here in this set, or yes, this key might be here. So we use bloom filters to say, I, have, I need a key. Let's say I want to value for key A. I go to bloom filter, say, hey, is A in this file? And the bloom filter says, no, no, no it's not here. So in most cases, we just read one file. We read many bloom filters, and we consult many bloom filters. But in the end, we usually do only one I.O. for point queries. And RocksDB also supports range lookups, or range queries. Range queries start at key uh, k, right, let's say, and then go next, 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 uh, in sorted order. So for range queries, um, bloom filters will not help us. So bloom filters will tell us, is this key here? But for range queries, we don't care if this key is here. We need the next key in sorted order. So we do need to read all of those files. Um, and then what helps is memory. Uh, let's say, in this case, we have level 4 is 500 gigabytes. Level 3 is 50 gigabytes. If you have 100 gigabyte memory, then everything uh, above level 4 could be cached. Uh, if you have a bit less amount of memory, 
then maybe your level four and level three will not be cached, and then we'll do, do two I.O. But in most cases, uh, if you have low amount of memory, you'll do two I.O., uh, level three and level four, because all, other will, all others will be cached because they're pretty small. But if you have uh, more memory, and usually we do uh, have quite a bit of memory in our, in our uh, server hardwares, we only do one I.O., even for range queries. We only do level four I.O., and everything else we can find resident memory. Um, so to reiterate, when we do a point query, let's say get me value uh, of the, for this key, Bloom filters make us avoid disk I.O. In most cases, we do only one physical read uh, from storage. Uh, range scans, Bloom filters don't help. Um, and for short scans, we do one uh, or two physical reads, depends on amount of memory and amount of data that's cached. <clears throat> cool. So now we go went over this like LS entry, how it works, how writes and reads work. Uh, let's talk about ROGSV files and what's our data format. So if you go to ROGSV directory, you do LS, you'll find something like this. Uh, you'll find the manifest something, something, a couple of log files, files with extension SST, uh, log file with a big LOG, uh, and so on. So we'll go over all these files, what they mean, and how we use them. So the most important file is manifest. Uh, manifest file is a file that contains our database, me me database metadata. It contains our LS entry, how it looks like. Uh, so that's obviously very important because if you lose that, you don't know uh, what's where and it's hard to... You your database is basically corrupt. If you delete your manifest file, you can't open your database. And what uh, manifest does, it enables us to have atomic updates uh, to data database metadata. Uh, so in this case, you can see the example of a manifest file. We start with initial state. Initial state that tells us this is the state of LS entry. You have L0 files. These are the file names of L0 files. We have files on level one. These are the file names of level one, and so on. Uh, and let's say a flush happens. What does flush do? What flush does is it takes memtable and flushes it to file. And so now what we have to do is we have to add that file to our LS entry. We have to say this file is now part of LS entry. But there's one more thing we have to do. Our updates are not idempotent, so that means I, I can't apply the same update twice and get the same result. So what we need to do when we do a flush, we also need to mark the write-ahead log as persisted. So at the same time, we have two updates. One thing is saying this log, don't recover it, and this file add it to the LS entry. So if we die before the flush happens, before the flush commit happens, we will, not, we will delete the file. We'll say, okay, we don't know this file. It's not part of LS entry and we will recover the same data from the right head log. If we die after uh, the flush commit, what we'll do is this file is now part of LS entry, file nine, and we don't replay that log. So that way we can make sure that after flush is done, the log updates will not get replayed uh, during recovery. Compaction, uh, what compaction does, it takes some files, merges them together and produces new files. Um, so what compaction record in manifest looks like, remove some files from LS entry and add some files from LS entry. Of course, those, all of those updates also have to be atomic. You don't want to add a file and not delete old files. Uh, and then we have some other updates like adding new colon families and so on that also we want to make um, in the manifest. Um, the second file we have is a write ahead log. Uh, I already talked a bit about it. Uh, it's basically the same format and same data structure as our manifest. So it supports adding a record, append only fashion, um, and it supports adding a couple of records atomically to the, um, to the file. So in this case, let's say I write key A with value B, I will add this update, uh, append this update to the write ahead log. In the second case, I, I have two writes, uh, write key uh, C with value D and write, write key uh, E with value F, those two updates will happen atomically. So either both of them will happen or none of them will happen. And this is pretty cool because what, let's say you, need, you have a table in MySQL or in Mongo and you have an index. You want to make sure that when you insert something to the table, you also insert indexed record in the index. And we can make in RocksDB to make the two updates happen together. So you, that way you know that your index is always consistent with uh, what's there in the table. And you don't have to worry about scanning the table uh, if you die. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And then, of course, we have deletes. We have some other. Yes, there's a question. Is this also present in a level DB as well? 
Correct, yeah. So the question is if this is uh, the same format as LabelDB, yes. We did some changes uh, to the format but, um, and to the, to the class, but most of it is still the same as LabelDB, yes. Um, and then, of course, we can mix and match the writes and deletes, uh, some basic stuff. And then the, the meat is table files. Uh, that's where we keep the data. Once you, know, you flush your, your, uh, your mem table or when you do compaction, we produce level file, uh, table files. Uh, table files are divided into blocks, and we have a couple of types of blocks. Uh, the block that contains the actual data, the keys and values, is called data block. And the way data block looks uh, is just a list of keys and values. Uh, something that's noteworthy here is that they are compressed. Each data block is individually compressed, and they're also prefix encoded. Uh, prefix, prefix encoded, what that means, if your two keys uh, share the same prefix, the second key will just say, hey, I share prefix of length 8 with the previous key. It will not repeat the same prefix. So we first prefix encode them, and then we compress them. And we write them out um, in a pen-only fashion. After we write written out all the data blocks, we need to write a couple of meta blocks. And the most important data meta block is index block. And uh, what index blocks contains is index to those data blocks. For each key, it has a pointer to data block. Um, so when you read a, a file and you want key, let's say, uh, B, you first go to index block and find in which data block this B key is contained. And then you go read the data block. Uh, we also have filter block. And filter block are just persisted Bloom filters. Uh, so we don't have to recreate them every time you open database. We persist them. Um, and then we have a couple of um, blocks like statistics. And statistics contains, let's say, number of deletions in this file. And we use that to guide our compaction strategies. And then we have meta index blocks, which points to index blocks and filter blocks and so on. Uh, so when you read the table, let's say you go to a table and say, I want uh, key A from this table. First what happens, you first you go to filter block. Check if this key even exists in the table. If it does, then you go to index block and say, in which data block can I find this key? And then index block will tell you, go to this data block, and then you load the data block from, uh, from file system, and you find your key. Um, in most cases, we keep both of our Bloom filters and index blocks in memory. Uh, because if you don't, then every time you go access a file, you have to load something from, from disk. So our Bloom filters, index blocks, they can be quite big, uh, but we keep, oh, try to always keep them in memory. <clears throat> And then block files are uh, just debugging output, this big LOG. Um, we have all our tuning options. We have all the flushes and compaction that happen, record some met metadata there so we can debug what, what's happening, our compactions to frequent. Uh, and we have some performance statistics, how fast uh, did the compaction happen, what's our write throughput. It's pretty cool because if somebody t calls you and tells you, hey, uh, my rocks to be slow, you can just tell them, Give me your log file, and you can read everything from there. Everything that's happening in the database is in the log file. Uh, well, yes, there's a question. Do you, do you log everything during production also? Uh, which one? During production. Are you, are you logging all the information you just spoke about in production clusters also? Yes, so the question is, are we logging everything in production? Yes, we do. And how much performance does that log have? We never really measured, but uh, flushes usually happen uh, very, uh, very, like let's say every couple of seconds, maybe every ten seconds, and compactions happen maybe every couple of minutes or even yeah, like tens of minutes. Uh, so when it happens, you know, we lock something, but it's not much data, and it happens very infrequently. It shouldn't be much of a overhead. Yeah, we never measure. Just because you know, it's not outputting many data. One, like a couple of seconds. Right. So you don't, you don't think it contributes significantly to the right amplification of the system? Uh, no, definitely doesn't. It does not contribute to the right amplification that much. Uh, it's few, very few data. Uh, much, much more data is coming to the right compassion and flushes. And it's very useful for us. When something happens, we just go log into the machine and see. Take a look at the log file. Um, one cool thing about LSM trees uh, is that table files are mutable. So you think about it. Everything happens in a mem table. Everything that's changing is changing in a mem table. And then flushes generate the whole file, compactions generate the whole file and delete the whole file. So when you have a file, it never changes. Once you write the file, it's there. Uh, so backups are very easy. Um, it's easy to do fast and incremental backups. What you do is you just check, hey, what files I have, 
what files are there in remote storage, and you just send the files that are new. Um, and so we've been using this a lot in various different services. And we even open source tool called RocksDB Strata, Rocks Strata, uh, which we use at Parse to back up uh, MongoDB clusters. And it can do also really cool stuff like uh, you send the files to remote storage and you can do live, uh, back, live, live queryable backups. So what it means you can create Mongo shell and switch to the backup and just query backup without restoring full data from backup. So you can do queries on top of your backups. You can check, hey, what was the value of this document a month ago, if you have a backup from a month ago. So yeah, backups of LSM are easy, and it's very cool. It's very cool, and we have built tooling around it that's all open source. Cool. And with this, I'll, I'll give Mark uh, the mic to talk about uh, what we are currently working on. a lot of benchmarking in the, the not really right amplification, but just the size of the, or the debug log. Um, by default, it's uh, set to info, informational level. It's too much uh, for me. But uh, I think for real workloads, the, uh, it definitely isn't a problem. And, and something important for embedded applications, the users, the internal RocksDB users are not RocksDB experts, and they're not even properly monitoring generally RocksDB. We, are, the provider, are expected to do that. But our application is not running under our control or the database. So we kind of generate a log file without their, uh, their intervention. And that just makes it easier to support production. Uh, we have the, the big work in progress for me is, is MySQL plus RocksDB. Um, we have another workload trying to get uh, RocksDB performant on pure disk. Um, you know, it's, it's a log structure merge tree. In the early 90s, when the first paper came out, we were talking about LSM is there for pure disk solutions because you avoid the random I.O. on page write back. Um, fast forward 20 years or so, and now at Facebook, we've been mostly talking about RocksDB for pure SSD workloads. So now we have uh, a big in-house user for, for disk. Uh, tiered storage, so some combination of emerging storage technologies. We have memory, eventually we'll have NVM, uh, NAND flash, and then disk array. Uh, can we, efficiency is a big thing for us. We have a lot of data. Uh, do we have to use SSD for everything? Or in the future, do we have to use NVM? If you ask the internal user, Yes, they want a pony, they want NVM, they want SSD. They don't want disk. Operations doesn't want disk. Disk makes life hard. Um, mistakes are, are slower to recover from. So being effective with tiered storage, though, can be a big deal. Uh, and then just another thing, the, is the MICA, or any of the peeper, people from MICA paper here? OK. So, uh, if you look at level DB or even rocks DB, the, the mem table is uh, reads are concurrent with everything. They don't are lock free. Uh, writes, there's a mutex. Um, if you look at a lot of the academic work and even production quality code like Hecaton, uh, everyone is doing lock free or highly concurrent uh, in memory structures that can be updated. We don't have that yet. So, um, web scale at for MySQL at Facebook, and this is a tier that I, I work on. Uh, numbers are from earlier this year, about 175 million queries per second at peak. I, I won't say how many servers. Uh, 12 billion rows read per second. The interesting thing with 140 million disk reads per second, and this is really uh, PCIe NAND flash. We're not using disk on this tier anymore. Uh, we're doing, at peak, almost one read from storage per query. So uh, even though we have a lot of data in, in memory and, and good caching, we have a very effective cache tier above the database. So we are seeing colder queries. And we are definitely IO, uh, using a lot of I.O. capacity. Uh, the size, many tens of petabytes. And this is after getting about 2x compression with NODB. Um, so we've already shrank the tier in half with uh, NODB, 
the reason for my rocks is hopefully we can shrink the tear in half again. Uh, it's a really big deal when you're using that much NAND flash. Availability, uh, many nines. Unfortunately, legal won't let me say how many, although we did, I think, increase it by an order of magnitude. We uh, deployed a solution for FET with uh, automated failover. So within 30 seconds of a master dying, we have automation. that There's no human intervention. Just the automation kicks in, uh, does the promotion, and um, we think it's lossless. Uh, it's, not, it's not Paxos or Raft, um, but we're claiming it's close enough to lossless that uh, it is called lossless. When you're dealing with production, even if you're dealing with synchronous replication, it's hard to say that anything is lossless. Uh, just things go wrong. But um, the fact that it is not losing commits means we're willing to automate it and let it run fast. The primary workload is social graph transaction processing, likes, uh, status updates, comments. We don't store video or pictures in the database. Uh, we do store metadata for video and pictures. So we actually, even though in public we've said we don't use MySQL for these solutions, those engineers are benefiting greatly from using MySQL for whoever does pictures at Facebook. Uh, messaging was deployed last year. Uh, it was put on top of HBase to improve uh, availability and response time, quality of service. We're using this with Presto to do parallel query for something that can, the data store gets trickle updates and then Presto does the parallel query on top of InnoDB. Uh, and then we have other users that just haven't been described in public. MySQL and RocksDB, again, the big win is 2x better compression compared to compressed InnoDB. Uh, but as we do a lot of performance work on it, there are some interesting problems that you don't hear described much in the LSM community. Um, the first one is uh, we're sharing an LSM tree across many indexes or many tables. Drop table, drop index has to be fast. I mean, it has to be uh, instantaneous. Now, if we have multiple indexes in one LSM tree, we can't do a delete on all of the, the key value pairs for the index. Um, so we, we have a way to reclaim the space in the background using a, a callback function run through the compaction filter. Every key value pair put into the LSM has an index ID as the leading part of the key. So we know we can identify the keys to be dropped. Optimizer statistics per SST file, as compaction is running, it's dropping old files, creating new files. We are uh, creating, we have a callback that runs during compaction when an SST is written. We use that to compute optimizer statistics that we need. And then um, on startup, we can collect this metadata to rebuild the, what the, the stats are for a given table. Uh, tombstones, we've had a lot of problems with tombstones on performance. It turns out if you look at level DB, they're really efficient at dropping old versions of keys during compaction. Uh, the algorithm that they use for dropping tombstones generally means tombstones are not dropped until the tombstone reaches the base, the base of the LSM. So we had queries that would encounter millions of tombstones um, and take seconds to finish, um, which was really lousy for performance. I think we've actually recently fixed this for Myrox. Um, we are mapping different indexes to different column families for configuration uh, differences. Uh, some column families will be tuned differently. Some, are, some column families are tuned for range scan. Others are tuned for point operations. Byte comparable keys, it's just we want to use memcomp to do the key comparisons in the index. We have composite keys. We have character set issues. We have variable length keys. All of this must be combined into a single string that's byte comparable. Uh, and then transactions. We've added uh, support for optimistic and pessimistic concurrency control for pure RocksDB applications. And then MySQL uses that. Um, another point is that there's many dimensions to better. A lot of the papers I read, uh, the focus is on throughput. A lot of the focus for me has been on efficiency. So we don't need to get 10x lower response time because the response time we get today is already sufficient. Uh, if we can get 10x better efficiency, and, and that would be hard to do, uh, that would be amazing. So 
you know, performance is one notion of better efficiency for a lot of us collecting user data that we have to, that we promise to store forever. Efficiency is a big win. And then uh, manageability. Uh, it's really hard to hire operations people. And so if your project, if your database minimizes the size of the operations team, it will be more popular. Uh, MongoDB, a big reason it's popular is it makes it easy for small startups to scale out a database. Uh, they're not winning the performance game versus MySQL, they're winning the manageability game. And then the last one is availability. If you're on call, do you have to wake up every time there's a server that died? Uh, it's a lousy on-call experience, which means your on-calls are going to quit. Uh, so it, it's kind of related to manageability. Um, in addition, the other benefit is your users are happier when there's less downtime. Storage efficiency for me, um, we can talk about read, write, and space amplification. Uh, read amplification, the simple definition is how many physical IOs do I do per query? I would really split this into read amplification for point and for range queries. So you're going to, going to consider it differently. You can also talk about it for in-memory structures separately from uh, persistent structures. Write amplification, how much am I writing per transaction or per query? Now what we mean by a write here is going to differ based on the technology. If it's disk, I probably care more about C, uh, seeks, random operations. Uh, if it's SSD, I care a lot more about bytes written because write endurance is an issue. So there's, you know, we have some wiggle room for what we're defining is the write amplification. Um, space amplification, just what's the size of my database versus the size of the data? My rocks, the big deal is space amplification is reduced in half compared to NODB. So we, we have different concerns um, depending on the workload. Tiered storage is just another way to pursue efficiency. So uh, a few years back, Facebook did this thing called flash cache. It's a persistent uh, write back cache that lets you map one storage device on top of another. It's transparent to the application. It's a Linux kernel module. We did this to put uh, PCI NAND flash on top of a disk array. So a fraction of the database was cached in the, in the flash. The entire database was on the disk array. Uh, the flash also absorbed a lot of writes and then gave us better elevator scheduling from flash to disk. We now have NVM, so we have a hierarchy forming between NVM uh, NAND flash and disk and eventually you'd like to move data down the hierarchy. Um, the question is how much awareness does the database algorithm require and how flexible is this? You know, If you make the wrong decision when putting data on disk, you're going to have some lousy response time as the workload changes. The other thing is that the efficiency that you care about, the different devices, you know, if you want to do sequential or large requests for reads and writes, disk is by far the cheapest. If you want to do a lot of write IOPS, then NVM is the best. If you want to do a lot of read IOPS, then NAND flash is the best. Um, for me, I think a, an LSM makes it easier to navigate these choices than an update in place B tree. So one of the exciting things for me with RocksDB is that we have a, an easier way of uh, pursuing these efficiency wins. Um, reinforcing this, I just used uh, retail data, public specifications, re list prices from Amazon for disk, TLC, and SSD. Um, the interesting metric for write megabytes per second, that was the most interesting one. I don't use the peak write rate for an SSD. I use the sustain write rate. My workload is 24-7. There's no downtime. There's a, a daily curve, but it, the device is always in use. So with the SSD, you need to consider what average daily write rate can I sustain in write megabytes per second to this device? Well, for TLC, that does about 1,000 device writes. You get about one device write a day, and per terabyte, you get about 10 megabytes per second. For MLC, which is moving down to about 3,000 device writes lifetime, over three years, you get about 30 megabytes per second sustain writes. 30, mites, 30 megabytes per second is not a ver uh, per terabyte is kind of low compared to what you get from a disk array. So the, the really big difference between the disk and the SSD, if you want to sustain 
writes over several years, um, the disk is go just going to be much, much cheaper. Um, if you want uh, random reads, definitely we're, we're looking at, uh, or random operations, we're looking at SSD. But we really want to use the SSD for reads. If possible, we'd like to use the, the disk for, for writes. Multi-threaded mem table, it is a concurrent skip list with a mutex, meaning the writes serialize, the reads are lock free. The writers serialize on the mutex. And the last point, um, we can fix this later. Judgment you know, of what to focus on now and what to punt on later, I, I think we, we assumed we would have had a, a solution by now for the multi-threaded mem table. Um, it's not there yet. And we are working on it, and I, next year, Next, we'll fix, it will be fixed next year. But you know, sometimes, some of these decisions are good, punting performance work to later. This one, I, I think we need to fix. What do you, what do you, how do you support reverse, reverse scans in uh, your skip list? You just have two pointers, next and previous. You, you store, okay. So open problems. The first big one is managing ingest. So ingest times write amplification um, should not exceed compaction throughput. If compaction can process 100 megabytes per second and your ingest uh, and your write amplification is 10, then your ingest over the long run cannot exceed 10 megabytes per second. Uh, if it does exceed that, then the, your LSM is going to get into bad shape. So the question is, you know, we kind of can estimate or measure at runtime what the compaction throughput is. We can see how much can I read and write to the disk array or to the SSD. How fast can compaction process data? We can also estimate write amplification. So from that we can figure out a target ingest we want to sustain. The, the challenge is how do, you how do you shape the ingest? You need to slow down writes at certain points in time. Writes are cheap in RocksDB. It's just write ahead log mem table. So, uh, we're still working on better ways to shape ingest and predict ingest to make sure it doesn't exceed what compaction can sustain. It means that some of this depends on the actual distribution of writes because if you have you know, a, a very skewed workload that you may need less compaction or score those in higher levels than three. Yes. So what are you targeting? So, uh, repeat the question for the video. So the, the question is, you know, if you have a skewed workload versus a synthetic uniform distribution of key updates, but I, I would say that will show up in the measurement because you, you can measure uh, your compaction throughput. You can measure how fast you can move data through compaction, and you can also measure your, your ingest. And if you're, if you're in a steady state, then from those you can compute the right amplification. With skew, Compaction doesn't go as far down the tree. It can hopefully stop early. However, there's a bug in RocksDB <laughs> where, where it wasn't doing that. So we have, in the benchmark client, we have an option to do a skewed update pattern. And I noticed that in one of the skewed update patterns, compaction was still going down to the base of the tree. When it, in theory, it should stop at the first level that holds the working set. But all I would say is you can measure compaction throughput and ingest, and from that you can compute the write amplification, which would be smaller in this case. And so you can measure this dynamically. Uh, another one, adaptive algorithm. So we have a lot of complexity in RocksDB. It's excellent if you want to do auto-tuning work. It's excellent if you want to sell professional services. It's hard to configure. Um, some of this is that we have a, a, a wide variety of workloads, but uh, can we move the, the cleverness into the algorithm rather than the cleverness into the person writing the configuration file? It's also important because we have a, uh, real workloads might have a, a mixture of behavior. With RocksDB, we have different column families we can use. We can tune the column family separately, but it's still static. So can we move the cleverness into the algorithm to reduce the complexity of the configuration? And also, depending on, we might have different goals. We might want to reduce read or write or space amplification, depending on the, the workload. Uh, Igor mentioned that you know, the, we, want the, we want the Bloom filter and index metadata to be in cache. 
And that's easy to do if the ratio of database size to RAM size is not too big. But as you grow database size versus RAM size, some of this changes. You don't want to do a disk read to the Bloom filter to figure out if you should avoid a disk read to the database file. You're still paying one disk read at that point. Uh, so how do you go about managing the case where the database, let's say it's 100 times RAM or 200 times RAM. Some of your caching strategies have to change. The, the size of the number of bits that you allocate per key to your Bloom filter has to change. Um, we want this to be dynamic um, with the goal of reducing disk reads for, for metadata. Um, one interesting topic is clustered index. With a clustered index, you need in cache one key per database block. With a non-clustered index, you need in cache one key per row in your database. So a clustered index, the amount of data that you need in cache is much less than with a non-clustered index. So there's just uh, some thinking. And um, since I work on MySQL and now RocksDB, I read a lot of people doing benchmarks against uh, RocksDB and MySQL. And usually, the other th system is claimed to be faster. Um, uh, Non-clustered indexes is something that has been used by some of the systems that are faster than RocksDB. Um, and the authors haven't always acknowledged the impact of requiring the use of a non-clustered index, meaning um, your database to RAM ratio cannot grow, grow as large as it could with RocksDB. Uh, X is faster than RocksDB. We love to read about these papers. Uh, they are interesting. And it means you're talking about RocksDB, which makes us happy. Uh, we also like academics. Uh, I only got par part of the way through grad school. Um, I do go to database conferences. So if you are working on this, please talk to us. We'll help, even if helping means you get better results on your side. Uh, we'll help explain the results that you get from RocksDB. Uh, but just talk to us. And, and that's, uh, that's it. So thank you. And you started working on level DB, what's the first thing when you started making box what's the first thing you had to change to make it like not be bad? Stop using MMAP. Okay. That was the first. I uh, the that was a trivial one. The big thing was multi-threaded compaction. So right initially with level DB it's one thread for mem table flush and one thread for doing all the rest of the compaction. And because of write amplification, you're you're amplifying. You know, the ingest is coming in very quickly. And if you want to sustain, let's say, 50 megabytes per second ingest with an amplification, right amplification of 10, you need to be writing out 500 megabytes per second. And even worse, if you're doing Zlib compression, Zlib is hard to have a single thread doing I.O. and uh, the Zlib compression at 500 megabytes per second. That's just not going to happen. So Snappy helps a lot. But multi-threading compaction was a, a really, really big deal um, to overcome the compaction stalls. And then we added early on throttling to try to keep the LSM in a good shape, even if compaction couldn't keep up. So we had a very primitive way of stalling writes um, so that compaction could keep up. Anybody else? So what's like a what's like a five year thing? Like my rocks is sort of on your on your one one year horizon. What's like a five year thing? If you had a magic wand, you could make happen that you you, you wish you could. You know, so I, I I market. I tweet. I blog a lot. I yes. market bugs for upstream vendors, usually MySQL, and then I also uh, market projects to academics. Um, so I just throw out ideas. The one I want, and this one I'm pushing to Wire Tiger as well. Wire Tiger has an LSM and a B tree. Uh, dynamically, have an algorithm that figures out what part of my index should be using a B tree, update in place, or even copy on write B tree. And can another part of my index look more like an LSM, depending on the workload and the goals I set for read, write, and space simplification? So, getting this dynamic algorithm that adjusts itself based on the, the 
the costs you want to reduce and the workload you see, getting that from a storage efficiency perspective is a big deal. And I don't see anyone doing it yet. Um, I, I think there's some interesting work there. Okay. All right, last chance. Go for it. Yeah, you. Um, so um, you said that uh, the MF was a problem because of the kernel bug. So did you try it again once the bug was fixed? Um, repeat the question. So the question was, have I revisited the MMAP issue when the kernel bug was fixed? Every time I've done, a, I do a lot of I.O. performance testing, and I've always had P read end up looking faster than MMAP. Maybe only 10% in terms of the I.O. rate I can sustain. The big problem for me with uh, MMAP, or a big problem is, do you know, does it know how much you want to read? So MMAP will do a, a, a file system page read. If I need more than a file system page, um, is my database informing uh, the file system that I actually want 12K of data or 8K of data? With SSDs, those should be bad, right? I mean, but this, what you say makes sense because with this you get rid of but with SSDs, it's a best thing. Sure, but if I, and I have, haven't done the test, but if I have a pause between the two reads because, you know, I, I wait for the first 4K to come back. And let's say there's no file system read ahead. So I wait for the first 4K to come back. I decompress it, and then I ask for a little bit more. That's always going to be slower than just saying, give me the 8K or the 12K. And especially when you say fast, that's latency. But if I care about throughput, I don't want to waste random IOPS even on the storage device. If I have a lot of throughput, I don't want to have something do two IOPS that really could have been solved in one. All right, uh, so in two weeks, I think we're having um, Ivan Bowman from SAP to talk about SQL Anywhere. Um, so definitely check out for that. And then the video will be posted online later today. So let's thank Mark and Igor one more time.